The following presentation was recorded at the 2011 Southeast Linux Fest in Spartanburg, South Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information about the Southeast Linux Fest, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following Diamond and Platinum sponsors in 2011 for helping make these videos possible. Access to read text and give text readings to kids who are in all likelihood bored to tears with all of the text that we see in front of us. Um, another thing that ISKME does, we put on an event called Big Ideas Fest. And the idea of Big Ideas Fest is to get lots of teachers together, smart people who deal with the problems of education every day, put them up in a really swank hotel in Half Moon Bay, California for a few days. Ritz Carlton, golf course, very nice. You know, get them a little liquored up. Um, get them in big groups and say, what are the biggest problems that you face and what sort of creative solutions can you think of that, that might help you solve some of these problems? Leaving the whole open education resource question aside. And the thing that they come back to again and again and again is that the kids are bored, right? And the reason the kids are bored is they sit in a classroom that looks the same way, basically, with a few bells and whistles that a classroom looked like in 1875, right? With, a, with maybe a shiny whiteboard at the front where if you write things on the whiteboard, it'll put it on a computer. Uh, but they're still sitting there and, you know, it's, uh, they, maybe they've got a textbook, maybe they don't, right? My, my nephew doesn't have any textbooks because his school system can't currently afford them. So, you know, but are, does that mean that they're getting computers in all these classes? No, it just means he gets more handouts, you know, and, uh, and, and there's like digital versions of stuff he can look at at home but doesn't have to. And he doesn't because he doesn't care. Um, so is, I mean, is, so how do you get through that, right? And that's a, sort of a, sort of a problem that when you're, when you, when, you, when you look at this all day, every day, you just think, there has to be more than this, right? Um, so I read two books in the past couple of years uh, that both got me thinking a lot about all of this. Um, and they also relate to a couple of stories that I'll tell. Uh, one of those books is a book called Reality is Broken. Uh, and it's written by a lady whose name escapes me at the moment, um, but Google it, Reality is Broken, and you'll find lots of people raving about her book. Because it basically talks about uh, the fact that uh, there are more hours being spent right now on video game play than were spent like in the entire productive history of mankind until like the 1800s or something. Right? I mean, a truly astonishing amount of people's brain time is going into online games, right? Uh, and the whole book basically talks about why that is, right? Um, and and the, the, uh, the, the conclusions are basically that games are really, really brilliantly built incentive engines, right? The whole point of a well-built video game is to provide incentives to play more video game, to spend more time playing video game, to spend more money on the next video game, right? Um, to spend more money on the gold that you need to buy the item that lets you get to the next level in the video game, right? It's a, it's a, a brilliant sort of uh, uh, engine for leveling up and giving people a sense of satisfaction, right? Faux achievement. Um, uh, any Farmville players in here? That's a little bit of, that's a, that's a little bit of an in-joke. I am the Lord of the Plow. My title in the Fedora Project is Lord of the Plow. The reason why, I just, so it's, it's just, I, the, the rest of this can wait. So here's a funny story. Um, my wife plays a lot of Farmville, and I mean a lot of Farmville, right? And she got tired of her own farm, 
So she basically commandeered my farm because like, everything's dying. You're never taking care of your farm. I'm like, well, you log in to take care of my farm. She said, that's exactly what I'm going to do. So she, uh, uh, she's over this mostly now, by the way, which is good because she was spending a ridiculous amount of money on little sheep and like, little sheep with shamrocks. And, um, sorry, honey. Um, yeah, so uh, we were at a meeting at Red Hat and uh, all of the various community folks were gathered around. We were having a Fedora activity day. Uh, and I had legitimately important things that I was working on. So I basically came into a meeting, said hi to everybody, and then said that I had some very important work to do and left. And so then a friend checked on Facebook and saw that I had just been awarded the Lord of the Plow in Farmville, right? So <laughs> without understanding what had gone on, Naturally, one assumes that I had big-timed all my friends so that I could go play Farmville, which was not, in fact, the case. Um, yeah, so, so I'm uh, the Lord of the Plow. Right, so, haha, ha, funny. The point of that is that <laughs> people spend a lot of time playing video games, right, because video games are more fun. Uh, and yet somehow we have not managed to harness that into anything for education in any sort of real way, right? Um, uh, interesting point number two that, that pertains to that. Uh, I worked for, uh, uh, when I worked for Red Hat, one of, the, one of the things I did there for a couple of years was I was Red Hat's community liaison to the uh, One Laptop Per Child project. Um, and in fact, the first time I uh, came down here to, to Spartanburg Greenville to talk about anything open source related was, I guess, about four years ago, maybe longer now, four or five years ago, where I was coming down to, to basically show the OLPC and talk to a bunch of people, and that's how I met most of the folks down here, in fact, and why I keep coming back every year. Um, and so when I was working with, with the folks at One Laptop Per Child, uh, I got to spend a lot of time up at MIT, and I got to spend a lot of time with the folks who were uh, writing the software, putting together the hardware, repairing the broken hardware. Um, and one of the things that continually happened with the hardware was that the JKLM keys would be completely worn all the way down to the metal because 13-year-old Nigerian kids had found doom, right? <laughs> right? So you build this awesome educational device, you know, the same thing once happened with the television. The television would be great. It will bring education to the masses, you know. Um, the OLPC will be great. It will bring education to the masses. Well, you know, you can try to give the masses something educational, but it doesn't mean that's what they're going to use it for, right? Um, so, hmm. Uh, and then I mentioned the other book that I, that I read. Um, and that book was a book by a fellow called Michael Horn. Uh, and it's a book called Disrupting Class. Uh, look it up. It was co-written by Clayton Christensen, who wrote The Innovator's Dilemma. And Michael Horn looks at the state of education today. I'll wiggle it. Maybe I should just put the Nyan Cats back on. <laughs> As it cycles through. I don't know why I care yet. There we go. All right. It won't matter for another 10 minutes. Anyway, um, yeah, Michael Horn and uh, Clayton Christensen. So Clayton Christensen wrote The Innovator's Dilemma. Anyone familiar? So those of you who know The Innovator's Dilemma, um, the idea behind The Innovator's Dilemma is that any entrenched system or company, business, uh, that tries to innovate uh, knows that it can't really innovate very much because it's already beholden to the customers and the systems that it already serves, right? And the nature of that arrangement means that almost all innovation comes from the outside, right? And the innovator's dilemma is that, uh, uh, you know, big wannabe innovator sees the little guy coming, sees him coming, right? Nothing they can do. Uh, you know, I... Uh, already have all of these government customers that are using Solaris and it's mostly good enough for them and if we just make these few tweaks they say they'll buy some more of it so that's what we're going to do and this Linux thing it's a fad, right? Uh, and then boom, roasted, right? Sun go away. Innovator's dilemma. 
education is in largely the same place, except it's, a, it's an innovator's dilemma. It's got all kinds of incumbency problems because you've got all the, you know, you've got, it's, it's all the way from school boards at the local level to the way schools are built, uh, all the way up to the federal government where they're continuing fights, you know, about the Department of Education. Um, and despite all of these fights and all this stuff, innovation in schools moves at a glacial pace. Glacial pace, right? Um, one of the things about the One Laptop Per Child project, one of the sort of underpinnings that sort of predicates the whole idea, uh, it, was a, it was a great line. It, I think it, maybe it was Seymour Papert, uh, who's like the constructionist guru. Maybe it was Negroponte himself. Anyway, the question was, how much would you have learned in school if you had had uh, a pencil for two days a week and you went to pencil lab to use it? <laughs> right? What are you doing in pencil lab today? I think we're going to learn how to draw circles with the pencil in pencil lab, right? Um, and that's how, that's, how, that's how computers are in classrooms. Uh, and so the idea behind OLPC was one-to-one uh, -to -one computing, right? And slowly we're finally getting to the, to the, to the idea that, you know, there are, some, there are some states that are actually doing one-to-one -one computing. But it's a tool that everyone should have, right? And uh, uh, computers are cheaper than textbooks. If you are spending X amount on textbooks, hundreds of dollars on textbooks, you get to the point where uh, the, the, the computer is cheaper. So those were the ideas behind one laptop per child. Um, and so hold on, I was, going, I was going somewhere with that. Give me a minute. I was talking about Michael Horn, Innovator's Dilemma, I think I was just talking about the general slow, slowness of innovation to, 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 take, uh, to take shape in education. Um, so, the good thing is that there, there, there are people who are starting to understand this and there are things that are happen, happening slowly. Uh, the Obama administration understands uh, sort of the, the, the power of, of open, right? And so they're spending a lot of, they recently put down a $2 billion grant for the Department of Labor to produce access to read text and give text readings to kids who are in all likelihood bored to tears with all of the text that we see in front of us. Um, Another thing that ISME does, we put on an event called Big Ideas Fest. And the idea of Big Ideas Fest is to get lots of teachers together, smart people who deal with the problems of education every day, put them up in a really swank hotel in Half Moon Bay, California for a few days. Ritz Carlton, golf course, very nice. You know, get them a little liquored up. Um, get them in big groups and say, what are the biggest problems that you face and what sort of creative solutions can you think of that, that might help you solve some of these problems, leaving the whole open education resource question aside. And the thing that they come back to again and again and again is that the kids are bored, right? And the reason the kids are bored is they sit in a classroom that looks the same way, basically, with a few bells and whistles that a classroom looked like in 1875, right? With, a, with maybe a shiny whiteboard at the front where if you write things on the whiteboard, it'll put it on a computer. Uh, but they're still sitting there and, you know, it's, uh, the, maybe they've got a textbook, maybe they don't, right? My, my nephew doesn't have any textbooks because his school system can't currently afford them. So, you know, but are, does that mean that they're getting computers in all these classes? No, it just means he gets more handouts, you know, and, uh, and, and there's like digital versions of stuff he can look at at home but doesn't have to. And he doesn't because he doesn't care. Um, so is, I mean, is, so how do you get through that, right? And that's a, sort of a, sort of a problem that when you're, <laughs> When you, when, you, when you look at this all day, every day, you just think, there has to be more than this, right? Um, so I read two books in the past couple of years uh, that both got me thinking a lot about all of this. Um, and they also relate to a couple of stories that I'll tell. Uh, one of those books is a book called Reality is Broken. Uh, and it's written by a lady whose name escapes me at the moment. 
um, but Google it, Reality is Broken, and you'll find lots of people raving about her book. Because it basically talks about uh, the fact that uh, there are more hours being spent right now on video game play than were spent like in the entire productive history of mankind until like the 1800s or something, right? I mean, a truly astonishing amount of people's brain time is going into online games, right? Uh, and the whole book basically talks about why that is, right? Um, and and the, the, uh, the, the conclusions are basically that games are really, really brilliantly built incentive engines, right? The whole point of a well-built video game is to provide incentives to play more video game, to spend more time playing video game, to spend more money on the next video game, right? Um, to spend more money on the gold that you need to buy the item that lets you get to the next level in the video game, right? It's a, it's a, a brilliant sort of uh, uh, engine for leveling up and giving people a sense of satisfaction, right? Faux achievement. Um, uh, any Farmville players in here? That's a little bit of that's a that's a little bit of an in joke. I am the Lord of the Plow. My title in the Fedora Project is Lord of the Plow. The reason why I just so it's, it's just I, the, the rest of this can wait. So here's a funny story. Um, my wife plays a lot of Farmville, and I mean a lot of Farmville, right? And she got tired of her own farm, so she basically commandeered my farm because like everything's dying. You're never taking care of your farm. I'm like, well, you log in to take care of my farm. She said that's exactly what I'm going to do. So she, uh, uh, she's over this mostly now, by the way, which is good because she was spending a ridiculous amount of money on little sheep and like, little sheep with shamrocks. And, um, sorry, honey. Um, yeah, so uh, we were at a meeting at Red Hat and uh, all of the various community folks were gathered around. We were having a Fedora activity day. Uh, and I had legitimately important things that I was working on, so I basically came into a meeting, said hi to everybody, and then said that I had some very important work to do, and left. And so then a friend checked on Facebook and saw that I had just been awarded the Lord of the Plow in Farmville, right? So <laughs> without understanding what had gone on, naturally one assumes that I had big-timed all my friends so that I could go play Farmville which was not, in fact, the case. Um, yeah, so, so I'm uh, the Lord of the Plow. Right, so, haha, ha, funny. The point of that is that <laughs> people spend a lot of time playing video games, right, because video games are more fun. Uh, and yet, somehow, we have not managed to harness that into anything for education in any sort of real way, right? Um, uh, interesting point number two that, that pertains to that. Uh, I worked for, uh, uh, wh when I worked for Red Hat, one of, the, one of the things I did there for a couple of years was I was Red Hat's community liaison to the uh, One Laptop Per Child project. Um, and in fact, the first time I uh, came down here to, to Spartanburg Greenville to talk about anything open source related was, I guess, about four years ago, maybe longer now four or five years ago, where I was coming down to, to basically show the OLPC and talk to a bunch of people, and that's how I met most of the folks down here, in fact, and why I keep coming back every year. Um, and so when I was working with, with the folks at One Laptop Per Child, uh, I got to spend a lot of time up at MIT, and I got to spend a lot of time with the folks who were uh, writing the software, putting together the hardware, repairing the broken hardware, um, and one of the things that continually happened with the hardware was that the JKLM keys would be completely worn all the way down to the metal because 13-year-old Nigerian kids had found doom, right? <laughs> right? So you build this awesome educational device, you know, the same thing once happened with the television. The television would be great. It will bring education to the masses, you know. 
Um, the OLPC will be great. It will bring education to the masses. Well, you know, you can try to give the masses something educational, but it doesn't mean that's what they're going to use it for, right? Um, so, hmm. Uh, and then I mentioned the other book that I, that I read, um, and that book was a book by a fellow called Michael Horn, uh, and it's a book called Disrupting Class. Uh, look it up. It was co-written by Clayton Christensen, who wrote The Innovator's Dilemma. And Michael Horn looks at the state of education today. I'll wiggle it. Maybe I should just put the Neon Cats back on. <laughs> As it cycles through. I don't know why I care yet. There we go. All right. It won't matter for another 10 minutes. Anyway. Um, yeah, Michael Horn and uh, Clayton Christensen. So Clayton Christensen wrote The Innovator's Dilemma. Anyone familiar? So... Those of you who know The Innovator's Dilemma, um, the idea behind The Innovator's Dilemma is that any entrenched system or company, business, uh, that tries to innovate uh, knows that it can't really innovate very much because it's already beholden to the customers and the systems that it already serves, right? And the nature of that arrangement means that almost all innovation comes from the outside, right? And the innovator's dilemma is that, uh, uh, you know, big wannabe innovator sees the little guy coming, sees him coming, right? Nothing they can do. Uh, you know, I uh, already have all of these government customers that are using Solaris, and it's mostly good enough for them. And if we just make these few tweaks, they say they'll buy some more of it, so that's what we're going to do. And this Linux thing, it's a fad, right? Uh, and then boom, roasted, right? Sun go away. Innovator's dilemma. Education is in largely the same place, except it's, a, it's an innovator's dilemma. It's got all kinds of incumbency problems because you've got all the, you know, you've got, it's, it's all the way from school boards at the local level to the way schools are built, uh, all the way up to the federal government where they're continuing fights, you know, about the Department of Education. Um, and despite all of these fights and all this stuff, innovation in schools moves at a glacial pace. Glacial pace, right? Um, one of the things about the One Laptop Per Child project, one of the sort of underpinnings that sort of predicates the whole idea, uh, it, was a, it was a great line. It, I think it, maybe it was Seymour Papert, uh, who's like the constructionist guru. Maybe it was Negroponte himself. Anyway, the question was, how much would you have learned in school if you had had uh, a pencil for two days a week and you went to pencil lab to use it? <laughs> All right? What are you doing in pencil lab today? I think we're going to learn how to draw circles with the pencil in pencil lab, right? Um, and that's how, that's, how, that's how computers are in classrooms. Uh, and so the idea behind OLPC was one-to-one uh, -one computing, right? And slowly we're finally getting to the, to the, to the idea that, you know, there are, some, there are some states that are actually doing one-to-one -one computing. But it's a tool that everyone should have, right? And uh, uh, computers are cheaper than textbooks. If you are spending X amount on textbooks, hundreds of dollars on textbooks, you get to the point where uh, the, the, the computer is cheaper. So those were the ideas behind one laptop per child. Um, and so hold on, I was, going, I was going somewhere with that. Give me a minute. I was talking about Michael Horn, Innovator's Dilemma. I think I was just talking about the general slow, slowness of innovation to, 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 take, uh, to take shape in education. Um, so, the good thing is that there, there, there are people who are starting to understand this and there are things that are happen, happening slowly. Uh, the Obama administration understands uh, sort of the, the, the power of, of open, right? And so they're spending a lot of, they recently put down a $2 billion grant for the Department of Labor to produce educational materials for trade schools, right? Um, and that $2 billion all has to be spent. Uh, any, they, anything that comes out of that $2 billion investment must be licensed, CC by, uh, and made available, right? So government money is starting to go into open resources. But none of that solves the problem of, you know, kids being bored, right? Um, so, I, you know, I, I figure uh, 
I've got lots of time on my hands. Yes, you have a question? The problem about kids being bored, how do you solve it? Do you turn on a little bit of games? If so, how much? Well, so this is the interesting thing. If you try to, and ah, oh, you know what? Thank you, because now I remember where I was going. You don't solve the problem for the kid in the American classroom, right? Because innovation happens at the edges. Innovation naturally happens in underserved communities, right? Those innovations happen for people who can't afford the big shiny thing, and so the cost of whatever the replacement technology is tends to go down and be more targeted to the people that it's serving. It may not as be good as all the stuff in the middle, but it's good enough that it's useful for these folks out here, and if you construct it right, they can sort of take that stuff and improve it and make it better, and the people serving that market grow because the market grows with it, and then suddenly you get to a tipping point where the stuff on the edges is just as good, better in some cases, but certainly good enough from a sort of cost perspective to say, well, hey, we can just use all this stuff, and why are we paying all this money for these things again? Why are we paying all these money for, you know, textbooks and, you know. So, so how much game is uh, too much? How much is not enough? Uh, well, the answer is that right now, uh, those educational games for the underserved communities around the world don't exist at all. Don't exist at all. Very little of the content that they actually need exists in any format, right? Um, and so the question that had, well, so, so what would it take to produce that, right? How much work does it take to produce something that kids around the world can use uh, that is vaguely educational, that is open, that is in a format that everyone can get to? Uh, how much would that take, right? How many people would it take to do that? Would it take, and how long, right? Would it take dozen years, hundred years, you know, tens of thousands of man hours. Well, uh, so, funny thing. Um, this dude Where's your M key, Max? <laughs> Waiting. Yeah, it's still online. Waiting. Transferring, waiting. So here's one of those innovators I'm talking about. His name is Sal Khan. How many people know of Sal Khan? Right, he's sort of famous now. And the reason he's famous is because he decided that he could take on at least part of this problem by himself. Right, one dude. So what Sal Khan did was he looked at all of the things that he thought that he needed to teach uh, uh, from a math perspective to his kid and kids like his kid. And he did these videos one at a time. Over a series of years, all kinds of worked examples. This is all video, right? So if you don't understand what it is that your teacher was trying to teach, you can go get one of bazillions of videos. Simple arithmetic, banking and money. He's branched off into biology, right? Look at all this stuff. Is Sal Khan a professor of education? He's not, right? Is he a teacher during the day? Is that his day job? It is not. And yet, this one dude, just from sitting down and saying, I'm gonna put together videos of all this stuff that I remember from college, and I'm gonna bone up on the stuff that I don't remember, because I just don't see that anyone has done this, so I'll do it, right? And that's why he is now 
one of Bill Gates' favorite people, And that's why Bill Gates is introducing Sal Khan at TED Talks and is also investing uh, tons and tons of money into the thing that Sal Khan started. Uh, so, so the idea here, there's two ideas here actually. Idea number one, you don't have to be an educational professor, right, or an educational professional to create useful educational resources if you've got some sort of sense and smarts and a good plan and you're motivated, right? That's lesson number one, right? And I mean, let's be fair, Sal Khan is a really smart dude. But none of the stuff he's teaching, I mean, you look at those things and it's like, you know, he's just, he's just explaining how things work. It's not, it's not that, it's not that complicated. Anyone here who has the sort of background could have done this. It's just that Sal was the guy who decided to do it, right? And it's like you look, it's like, oh, he could have done that, and he did it. Now he's famous. Go. Right? Uh, and there was a second point there that I just completely forgot. How is that fun for kids? It's fun for Ah, how kids is this fun? Oh, that's. Like us. So the question is, how is this fun for kids? That's a very good question. Um, well, first of all, the answer is that uh, it's not necessarily super fun for kids. But it is more fun than having to sit and remember all of it and write down and take notes and read and remember and read it all in the book when you're stuck. And you can just, like, what was that? I don't remember. Oh, let me go ask Sal Khan. You know, and he gives a 10-minute thing. So it may not be a lot of fun, but it is effective, right? Uh, but no, it's not that fun. So what would be fun? Right? Games would be fun. <laughs> Games would be fun. Um, games would be fun. So, there's been a lot of educational games, all kinds of educational games that have been produced. Um, Max, what was the name of the game you played when you were third and fourth grade? Number Munchers. Did anyone else play Number Munchers when they were in the third and fourth grade? Look at that! Look at all these people who played Number Munchers. And did that not teach you everything you needed to know about math right there? Absolutely. Absolutely. Really? Kind of. Enough to add, right? That's something, right? Enough to, man enough to manage the fedora budget, right? <laughs> right. Um, and lots of kids remember these games, right? They remember these sort of things because games are sticky, right? Games are sticky. They stick. Um, and there's, there's all kinds of flash games that are out there. Ah, but flash, right? Closed source, can't get to it. Um, and there's all kinds of abandonware DOS games and, you know, weird funky Java games. And, you know, there's, there's a lot of the great GNU games that are, that are, you know, good and fun. But, and here's where everyone goes, ooh, only runs on like 0.1% of the desktops in the world. Ooh, right? It's a tough thing to have to say at Southeast Linux Fest, especially when I was a Linux guy for years and years. But the reality is that if you want to achieve massive penetration using open source, you've got to go to a platform that everybody has. And that platform is now HTML5, right? It's open. It's almost as good as Flash. Google has put a crazy amount of money behind it, right? And anything that Google puts a crazy amount of money behind, you can safely bet is going to win, right? Um, <laughs> hey, dude. <laughs> it is what it is. I'm just saying, right? And can run on this as well as it can run on that, right? And whether XOs, whether OLPCs achieve massive worldwide penetration or not, these things are going to achieve worldwide penetration, right? The time will come when the, when the cost of goods sold on one of these things is going to come down to the point where this is available in third world countries, right? And you think they don't use this stuff for everything they can? So, uh, this is a game in HTML5. I wrote it in about three weeks. Uh, not from scratch because I'm a moron, but basically I took a code, a code base from, a, from an open source game called Akihabara, right? Which is an HTML5 
gaming engine. Uh, I guess now I'll turn the sound on. This gets really annoying when you're developing, by the way. So uh, patch is welcome, right? If you know how to make an AUG file using a tracker or something like that, feel free to contribute some music. Let's play on easy. Right? So understand what is involved here. This is, this is not rocket science, right? This is JavaScript. It's a little bit ugly, so it helps if you kind of know your way around JavaScript, but I am by no means a JavaScript genius. Uh, I just took a game, uh, this is basically exactly what the game I built it on looks like. I didn't change any of the sprites, I didn't change any of that stuff, I just changed some dialogue and added some puzzles, right? Do to do to do to do. <laughs> Learn math, become a legend, woo, yay, so I'm going to wander into this sort of, yay. Oh, I'm on a quest. Do to do. You know, and you've got dialogue and characters and, you know, it's, uh, you know, and it, and this is, this is HTML5, and people have frequently said, I thought this was a Flash game, right? Except it's not a Flash game, because with a Flash game, you can't do this. Well, apparently with this, you can't do this either. <laughs> it opened a new window, and your windows are, oh, wait, here it is. I've got to drag the window back over to the right desktop, because we've got the multiple. Come on, there we go, look at that. See, all these libraries, right? And this was written, and this is the great thing about open source. This was written by a dude who was writing this to do his own, th there's this like game designer game jam thing, and he wrote this game engine to basically make cool stuff for game jams, and then he was gonna take this and turn it into like Facebook games, things like that, right? And he just wrote all of this code and then just sort of gave it away and said, well, okay, let's see what you can do with this, right? He's an Italian guy, he's very sort of, his English sounds Italian when he types. Um, <laughs> You know, and then I sent him a note at one point, and I said, yeah, I'm thinking about using this as a platform for education games. And he's like, that's crazy. I never thought of that, you know? Because um, if you should see this someday, I'm, I'm sorry to, I hope I'm not slandering you. It's a good, it's okay. <laughs> My princess is another castle. All right. You know, and none of this is, I mean, this is all fairly readable if you've done any programming at all, right? And I'm a chimp, okay? I'm not, people in this room who have had to use my code can attest that I'm not what you would call a skillful coder, right? And yet, I put all of this stuff together probably in a matter of uh, uh, a few uh, uh, Mountain Dew fueled weekends, right? So we go down, and let's, you know, and let's, let's actually, let's play the game a little bit. Let's see how it works, right? It's a five alive, you know? Want to escape the level above? Do something or other. Walk over only those numbers that are divisible by five. Hmm, can I then go to the red button and the stairs will, oh, can I do that, right? Is this this kind of stuff that, that a kid might understand, right? You know, am I a professional game developer? I most assuredly am not. And if an idiot like me can do it, then just about anybody with some basic JavaScript skill can you know, start with these fairly basic kinds of things and make all kinds of really cool stuff. Right, what did it say divisible by three? So three, four is divisible by three, right? Yeah, seven, that's divisible by three. 26, that's divisible by three. So, no, you fail it. Oh, all right, well, let's uh, do that. Yeah, what if I talk to her? What does she say now? I don't remember. I attack you. Oh, I can't get to her. Oh, damn it. I'll go. <laughs> Oops, sorry. All right, let's talk, talk to her from over here. No, I'm just going to. Oh, there we go. Is a number divisible by three? You moron. I told you that. Here's a neat trick. Add the digits together. Do you get three, six, or nine? Oh. Oh, that's kind of cool. Hmm. Right. So there's a little pedagogy in there. Right, just a little bit, it's not that hard, right? We convince ourselves, and I would argue sometimes 
with the help, oh, I'm going to have to do it again. We convince ourselves, I would argue, sometimes with the help of profess uh, professionals who are deeply invested in what it is that they do for a living, that we can't do those same things because we don't have the training or the background or the smarts, right? And to some degree that's true, but to a large degree it isn't. If there's anything we've learned in the open source world, it's that motivated amateurs can produce code that can surpass the, uh, the abilities of the, the, the greatest bunches of coders around, right? Some grad student in Finland, because he's got a, a, you know, a, assignments he's working on and he wants to play with something cool and he's got the whole POSIX standard sitting there just waiting to be recreated by himself, <laughs> you know. <laughs> um, you know, and it's a, it's a ridiculous idiot thing to try to do, but, you know, what else are you going to do on a Friday night when your wife is playing Farmville, right? <laughs> so, oh, hey, my class is complete. What am I going to go do now? I might do it on time, by the way, because I'm not really going to talk much more. I'm probably just going to play a bunch of games now. The village. Are there any questions? Any? So at the end of this, by the way, is probably going to be a, a pitch, right? I'm going to I'm going to ask if there's anyone here who's interested in this kind of thing, right? Because here's the thing, and there's a there's a uh, I'm really bad at talking and playing at the same time. Hold on. I gotta get through this level. Are you the one they call the factorer? Oh yeah. Oh, you know I am, old man. There are many monsters here, and they're very strong. We have heard that you know how to cut them down to size. Oh, really? A factoring sword? What is that? You know? You know, is this, is this going to be fun for a kid? I have no idea until I find kids to play it, right? This is still an idea, right? I, think, I happen to think it's a really good idea. I, I happen to think that if I find the right help and if people sort of agree, uh, that it can be an incredibly powerful idea. Because again, this is, this is like maybe, maybe 60 hours of total investment in, in development time over the lifetime of all the things that I built here? Oh, it's the red pig. I'm going to attack the red pig. Ow. Up. Oh. So we had four hit points, now he has two. Ow. All right, yay, money. And you can see the upper left, I've got my X2 factoring sword. I'll go back to my regular sword. Do to do. Oh, ow. I'm really bad at this game. Bad at all games. Oh, that one has eight hit points. All right, so I'll go back to my factoring sword. You know, ba, 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 ba. Aha. I kill you. Now I'll attack you. Six, three. Wait a minute. Wait, a multiple of three? What is that? Where's my three times? Uh oh. Well, that's an arrow. That would do me no good. I'm not sure how I get out of this, actually. Did I even finish the end of this? Ow, I think I'm going to die very soon here. These things are fast. What's that? So you're, you're learning that you can't kill the monster unless you can kill him in the appropriate... Uh, uh, I don't know. Is that what I'm learning? Maybe. Is that what it is? Like, Would that be what a kid learns? I don't know. I think that's what I was trying to impart. Oh, I got a 3x sword. Uh-oh. Oh, now game on. Now we're going to tear it up. Bam, bam, oh. Oh, I gotta switch to my 3X sword. There we go. <laughs> All right. Games are fun, you know? Even when you're supposed to be giving a talk, right? You just would rather play the game because the things are, oh, game over. Because I'm, I'm horrible, I'm awful at everything I play. All right. Um, 10 minutes. That's a good, that's a good, so. What does an idea like this need to succeed, right? And that's an open question because I don't know, right? I've got, so, and there are a few things that I do know, right? Uh, and these sort of come to the structure of how educational resources are packaged and made available. 
and the progression from one skill to another, right? One of the great things about the rigorous world of education is that there are standards galore, right? There are kind of too many standards, in fact, and every state has their own, but there's an initiative going on called the Common Core Curriculum uh, 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 Framework. Well, it's co Common Core something. I don't know what goes at, but Common Core. Uh, and the idea is to have all of these states that have different curricula uh, that are like subtly different, you know, and differ in like three words in this substandard and two words, and you, you learn this one a year before you learn this one, to try to get them all to adopt the same standard, right? Um, an open unified standard is a very important thing when you're trying to build great big things and fill lots of holes, right? So if we wanted to produce games like this for every learning objective through eighth grade, right? Uh, we actually have one list now, instead of 50, where you can actually look down the list and say, do we have a game that teaches this concept? <coughs> no, so, you know, let's put a bounty on this one, or, you know, and we can have uh, a little grid, right? And when we tick off all the little boxes on the little grid, suddenly we'll have an open source browser available video game that can teach every concept from kindergarten through eighth grade, right? I would love to have the time to do this myself, but I'm a CTO now. And as a CTO, I can sort of talk about these kinds of projects and tell you how cool I think they are and give you some of my thoughts on how we might get there and maybe put together some hack fests and, you know, open an IRC channel, a mailing list and all that kind of stuff. Um, but that's about all I can do, right? But that could be enough. So, uh, so does that answer your question from earlier? Is that fun enough? Yeah. Maybe? Sure. Would you have played that instead of number munchers? Yes. Yes, you would have. Will you play that instead of number munchers now? Do you want to, do you want to have a challenge? I would play that instead of Grand Theft Auto now. <laughs> <laughs> You're too kind. Um, well, that's because Grant that thought it was hard. This you probably have a chance of getting through. Uh, I don't know. I'm kind of done. I'm kind of wore out. Um, so let me... That's a good question. So, right. So, so what's the question there? So I can rep so report like it for the. Oh, um, how do you get this to people's kids that aren't yours? How do you get this to people's kids that aren't yours? It's a good question. It's a very good question. The first thing you do is get it to a point where uh, it feels like it's actually useful instead of a proof of concept, in my opinion. Um, but maybe maybe it's close enough. I don't know. Um, uh, my good friend Sebastian, who uh, is, uh, used to work uh, with me at OLPC, uh, is now a Red Hatter, and I think he's now like 22 years old, 21. I met him when he was 17, when he was working on a, a sugar, and I had no idea that he wasn't like a grown-up. Um, that's how it works. Uh, he set up uh, a, a visit with a school in the Boston area, I can't remember exactly where, it's, uh, it's an academy, it's a charter school that uh, is teaching uh, uh, computer skills as an integral part of the curriculum from grades 7 through 12. So we're going to have 8th graders not only play in this but hacking on it, hopefully sometime this summer. Uh, my guess is that I have dramatically underestimated how quote unquote easy it is to do some of this stuff. It's easy for me because, you know, I've been programming for long enough that even though I know I'm a bad coder, I know what good code looks like and I know how it's supposed to work, right? Eighth graders, not so much. What's a loop? Um, and, and yet, you know, we showed this to the teachers and those teachers said, you know, this, is, this, is, this would be a stretch for them but not a crazy stretch and our two or three brightest kids would love to do something like this. Because you know what? Not only do kids want to play games, but kids who are interested in computers want to make games. And they want to make games, if they're boys especially, as bloody and gory as they possibly can. 
All right? So you give them a little thing. Well, teach some math while you're shooting the war pigs with the cannons and, you know. So, uh, you know, how do we get them in front of massive amounts of kids? It's just there's no secret. Now, you know, you tell a friend, a uh, friend tells another friend, and that's part of what I'm asking help with, right? If this is a worthwhile idea, tell your friends, and I'll give you some information about how to do that that I would have put in the deck that I would have written, but I decided not to write a deck. So hold on. Because I wrote half of it, got bored with it. Max, if I want to open a big open office window, how do I do it in this terrible GNOME 3 interface? Oh, wait, it's GNOME 2, and I've just forgotten how it works. <laughs> what, what I'm really asking is where is uh, open office here? Just go to the oh, wait, I'll just accessories. I'm just going to open gedit. That'll work. <laughs> Quiet, you. I don't need technical support. I'm a Linux professional. Greg at iskme.org. Uh -huh. Tinygames.org. And now I'm going to blow this up to a great big font size. And move, it over to the other and move it over to the other window, yes. I want to get it just right before I do that, you see. Can I set font size in gedit? <laughs> no. Huh? All right, well, there it is. You can read that. And if you can't read that, just come closer. <laughs> my skills are legendary. Okay, so that's my email address, greg at iskme.org. And the website that is currently, uh, it's a sadly underpowered media wiki that's got a lot of outdated content is tinygames.org. But really, if this interests you and you like games or know someone who likes games, want to code, want to talk about it, want to contribute in any way, uh, just send me an email and we can surely figure something out, right? At this point, all I'm trying to do is find people who are interested enough to help. Um, and that can be in big ways or small ways, right? It's I can code or I can talk to people or I can, you know, do whatever. I haven't gotten to the point where, you know, having run communities for a living, I know all of the things that are required to make a community successful and I know that I have time for very few of those things. So phase one is just tell people about it as much as I can and get them to say, yes, that's cool. And then I'll get a long list of the people who say, yes, that's cool. And then I'll say, do you want to spend two hours this weekend? No, I can't. My wife has in-laws in. And no, I, you, and no, no, I can't, sorry. And then I'll find like three or four people who are committed and, you know, and, and we'll, we'll work on it. And maybe it'll turn into something amazing. And maybe it won't. But uh, I think it's worth a shot and I think it's interesting. And I thank you all for, uh, coming. So, that's it. Uh, I, I have time left for questions, I presume, if there are any. Any questions? Questions? Anyone? Anyone? Oh, I'm going to put up, uh, well, I'll, the, yeah, well tiny, just go to Tiny Games. You can play it at some point. It'll be broken until later this afternoon when I fix it. No? All right, very good. I can help with like it. it. We have the same problem. What would happen if you did this? this? You gave me a I good found idea. a problem. How do you do that? It's like this. Well, I disagree with that. Really? Who would have thought of that? Let's put the word out.
As a service leader in cloud computing, all we do is hosted computing. To us, the cloud is just the next generation of hosting. And as someone who's been in the hosting industry for 12 years, we feel we're in a unique position to really help bring these two worlds together, these different sets of technologies, and to help companies embrace this new world and this great new tool that allows faster innovation. Not only is it about us being responsive and accountable, but it's about us doing more for you. WebOS, an OS that works the way that you do. Across all your devices, HP Slate and WebOS, HP.